Hi, I'm Steve Hauser, the current president of the American Heart Association, and I'm here today with Profes Professor James Rothman, who was the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2013. And it's our great honor to have Dr. Rothman here today to have a conversation with us about his career and the, the work that he's done. Um, Dr. Rothman, glad you're here. We're honored to have you. And I, could you, tell, you. could you tell us a little bit about your career and how, how you got started um, and a little bit about your work? All right. Well, Steve, thanks for asking. And let me just say I'm really happy to be here with the American Heart Association today because uh, the AHA is a great organization that does great things for the public. Thank you. Um, my, my own, uh, actually, I'm a medical school dropout. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, uh, I have nine months left or so of Harvard Medical School, according to a letter when I left from the dean, and my mother has still been asking me to take a sabbatical. <laughs> uh, I, my undergraduate degree was at Yale, uh, and I studied physics. And my dad, who was a small town practitioner in pediatrics, he, uh, uh, he, he thought I should really have a look at medicine. Uh, and so I took a biology course, uh, and that was it for me. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to medical school. And I started out at Harvard Medical School. Uh, I ended up in the MD-PhD program, and then minus the MD, because research was just uh, uh, too uh, attractive uh, to me. Uh, I've loved science from the very first moment, and it's been a great privilege to have a career uh, in science. So that's kind of how I got my start. That's great. So I've read some of your papers on vesicular transport. Could you tell us a little bit about your work and how it evolved over the years and mm. led to a Nobel Prize? Well, you know, any recipient to the Nobel Prize who will tell you that they know how they got a Nobel <laughs> Prize, I don't, know, I don't know how they figure that one out. But uh, I can tell you where I got started for sure. Uh, it was actually in my histology lectures as a first year medical student. And uh, I'll talk today about uh, the founder of the field I work in, George Pilati, uh, who received the Nobel Prize in 1974 or so. And uh, Professor Pilati, um, his work was very fresh when I was in medical school in the early 1970s. And I remember hearing uh, at lectures uh, this wonderful, beautiful uh, extravaganza that goes on inside the cell. Transport vesicles were discovered, the organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus were being discovered. And it was just a great mystery. And somehow, as a former physicist, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, what sort of forces would be going on inside of a cell that would that would, uh, that would form these remarkable structures and, uh, and, and tell them where to go without you know, ongoing human instruction. It was just an amazing thing. And somehow that thought stuck with me, uh, and uh, it was a problem I felt I wanted to solve. Well, that, that's So great. it was an early inspiration, actually. <laughs> you know? So could you tell us some of your mentors uh, over the years and people that helped guide your career? Yeah. Um, well, I've had, I've had the benefit of really having, uh, I've been privileged to work with great scientists at every stage of my career. But probably the person who had the greatest influence on me is a person who I never actually worked with, uh, and, but I worked next to. And this is Arthur Kornberg. Uh, Arthur uh, was the head and founder of the biochemistry department at Stanford University Medical School, a Nobel laureate himself for discovering the basics of how uh, chromosomes are replicated. And um, he recruited me right out of medical school. That's actually why I left medical school. Uh, and I was offered, I mean, a tough choice, okay, you can be an assistant professor at Stanford in what was clearly the best department of biochemistry, working with the master, uh, you know, probably more, certainly one of the greatest biochemists of the cent last century, uh, or you can uh, finish an internship. And it was actually a tough choice, but, um, but I, I chose uh, that opportunity. And he was an inspiration to me because he took on one of the toughest problems uh, in all of biology and medicine how the cell's genes are duplicated in cell division faithfully. And he took the approach of a chemist, and he had a fearless attitude, which was no matter how complex a process is biologically, that process can be reproduced outside of a cell. It's sort of the antidote of 19th century vitalism. And I took that as kind of an encouragement and the chance to have a laboratory next to this uh, absolute icon uh, really inspired my own work when it went through a period of a number of very difficult years. So I actually owe this guy a lot. We all have great mentors, and we need, yeah. we need them. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about how your work uh, could have impact on individuals with cardiovascular diseases or stroke? Mm. Um, I think that's a tougher one, uh, quite honestly. Uh, you know, uh, let's just start with why do we do basic science, okay? I mean, we do basic science 
Uh, and basic science goes, it falls into all kinds of categories. The most fundamental type of basic science, which is what I do, uh, is uh, its goal is to understand the essence of life. And, and when we figure something out, it more often than not explains something, uh, a, a basic process like trafficking of proteins in the cell, secretion of hormones, which is what I've been working on, explains processes like this in every living cell. So our discoveries apply to plants, they apply to people, and they apply to yeast. <laughs> That's pretty fundamental, okay? And yet they explain processes as diverse in the human body, body as synaptic transmission, control of the heartbeat, uh, the, the uh, well, in neurology, the, the neurotransmission in the brain, the release of insulin, uh, and, uh, the, and, and the way insulin exerts the controls in, in, in metabolism and diabetes, and I can go on and on. In, in fact, about 20% of the human genome uh, utilizes the pathways that we describe. So what we do in basic science of this kind, foundational bi basic science, is literally to provide the conceptual foundations that enable translational researchers and physiologists to better understand the particular problems that they're interested in. And so, um, you know, in some ways you might say basic science of this kind, well, what does it bring? But what it brings is the ability to actually ask the questions in a more precise way that will bring answers and, and cures. So I think that's a, a fair assessment. And that's what the Nobel Committee tries to recognize when it recognizes the full breadth of contributions in research. And it's also one of the reasons that uh, the community values the American Heart Association because we know the AHA for example, through inviting me to lecture here, has uh, a, a value system that encompasses the full range of, of uh, research and, and teaching and, and practice. I think it's very well put. When, when I describe basic science, I say it's the foundation that we must have in, in order to find mm -hmm. mechanisms of disease and cures for those diseases. Without the fundamental understanding, mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. very difficult to make progress. Well, you know, and Steve, if I can add to that, I think we're entering a new era where fund foundational research of the kind that, that we and many other people do um, will find a, way, a more direct way to impact translation, and that is through human genetics. Uh, you know, tr if, if the genes that control vesicle trafficking, the, the process that I happen to study, well, those genes, you know, if you really, if you knock out one of those genes or you have a very bad mutation, the, 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 you won't even be born. I mean, your, your, your embryo might not even be fertilized, okay? But uh, through uh, deep sequencing of the human genome uh, in many patients, which is what we're beginning to see happen, um, there will be subtle changes in so-called alleles. Those are, you know, genes that get winged but not completely crippled, okay? <laughs> and as a result, the entire body isn't affected, but some system in the body is more affected. And, uh, I'll describe today a, an example of a gene uh, that if you take it out, your brain won't work at all, you, your body won't develop, but it got winged in a way that causes a, a certain uh, uh, neurological syndrome. And, and I think we're going to see more and more of those. And those subtle effects within the aggregate will add to our conceptual foundation of where the targets are in disease in humans in the way that the richness of human genetics uh, can only provide. So Thank I think we'll see more of that, not less of that. Thank you. So. To the young people who will watch this uh, online, do you have any words of advice or wisdom that you might give them to inspire them to continue mm. their path in science? Yeah, you know, I must say that after the Nobel Prize, I've been asked for my advice a lot more, <laughs> but I'm not sure that it's, it's worth any more. <laughs> and uh, the advice I, I used to give uh, young scientists before, which I would still give again, is don't take any advice from an old man. <laughs> you go with your own heart because uh, the conventional wisdom is likely to be wrong most of the time. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and my fervent hope is that uh, society, uh, meaning in this case the NIH, which has faithfully supported my research over many years, uh, will continue to recognize uh, the importance of the full range of science. We've seen uh, an increase in the number of top-down projects rather than bottom-up investigator-initiated projects at the NIH. And I think there's some changes in that direction I'm happy with, but historically, uh, the size of research grants, let me just give you an example. Um, when I started as an assistant professor at Stanford, my research grant, uh, which was obtained with no preliminary data, okay, and not having worked in the field, so that doesn't exist today. And the success rate, for those of you young scientists will know exactly what this means, was 45%. You know? I had a 50% chance off the bat with no practice uh, getting a grant. That grant was $90,000 in direct cost. That was 1978, 79, something like that. 
adjust for scientific inflation, that would be, I don't know, $350,000, $400,000 today. Well, if you're lucky with a 10 or 15 percent success rate, and I don't care if you're doing basic or translational research, same deal, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get maybe uh, $200,000. So the level of support, uh, and you can't blame the NIH for that, really, okay? The NIH deals in an ecosystem. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Congress, it's the NIH, it's also us as institutions. We have to prioritize, but somehow we've got to set the ship right or, or, or uh, we will, as a country, lose our competitiveness and, and I think more importantly, uh, the, the next generation of uh, treatments will be slowed down. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you here at the American Heart Association, and we all look forward to your talk later today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.